спасибо, Роуз Ли. Такое обилие изображений, очень много мыслей для размышлений. Следующий наш докладчик – Анна Жанески. Человек молодой, очень известный уже, особенно в той среде, которая так или иначе связана с искусством перформанса. В течение нескольких лет она курировала проекты в Варшавском музее современного искусства. Работала над проектами выставочными в Музее современного искусства в Любляне, в частности, помогал организовывать This is all film, experimental film in former Yugoslavia. И сегодня она сотрудник Museum of Modern Art, она заместитель куратора отдела медиа перформанса, соответственно, занимается всем, что связано с искусством действия, с акционизмом сегодняшних дней. Она расскажет нам о перформ перформансе танца и живом искусстве в рамках институции. Ее доклад называется «Это не игра». Пожалуйста, приветствуем нового докладчика. So good afternoon again, and I would like again to thank you, the Kate and Snezhana and Sasha for the introduction and all the Garar staff for this incredible event. So considering the, the, the subject of the, of, of the conference, but particularly the, the somehow the introduction to this afternoon session about the political and the social and economic conditions of performance and the performance as the most immediate expression of today, somehow I couldn't avoid also talking about uh, my, my, my position as a cu associate curator of medium performance and the medium performance art department uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So what I would like to share with you uh, is some thoughts, challenges, or even doubts maybe, about organizing, presenting, collecting, distributing performance and live art in the museum. And also maybe try to understand where this all interest into performance started, like where are the roots and why we are so striving for it. So I will, when I'm talking about some examples and when I'm talking also about the museum and particularly about MoMA, I'm aware that I'm talking also about the museum who determines a certain canon and who has been done in, in, the, last, in, the, in the last century also. And if we think about the museum, the basic uh, uh, assumption that conventionally museums are there to preserve and show objects. So all the system, all the structure in the museum is conceived for those purposes. And we all know that the, the space of the museum, in the gallery of the museum are usually white neutral, pure, clean spaces that are devoid of any experience. There are anything that is outside the world, it's left uh, outside. And it created a very perfect and very um, somehow determined uh, viewer also, who just move around and have this aesthetic experience with the object. But so if we're thinking, of course, of the, of the white cube, uh, there is also a certain movement exactly in the white cube. You know, you need somehow to, to, to go through, to, you need to pass this, uh, um, um, sorry, you need to, uh, to da -da 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 -da. You need to cover, this is the word I was missing, you need to cover the distance that between the viewer and the, uh, and the object. So if we think about the movement in the, in the museum, like one of the most radical examples about movement in the museum that came to our mind, it's from a film actually, it's the, it's from uh, Aban de Par, the Jean-Luc Godard in 64, and it's this race through the Louvre Museum of three of the protagonists. But then there is this image that is not from the film. This is a performance from 1974 at MoMA done by the Argentinian artist Marta Minujin uh, called Kidnapping, where she actually uh, kidnapped certain persons who were really kidnapped and uh, it was an homage to Picasso and there was an opera going on in the museum. 
So actually there is a, a history of the, of the performance and even of dance in the Museum of Modern Art that is somehow unknown and somehow still unofficial because when the museum was formed in the, in the late 30s and, the, and until the mid of the 40s, there were actually a department to dance and theater. It changed its name several times. There was a big archive of, of dance who was donated by the founder of the New York City Ballet, Lincoln Kirsten. And so uh, until 46, there was a department of theater arts. And then if we think about the live events, it will usually happen in the garden. This is Jean Tingley, homage in New York. I will go just quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Then Alan Kaprov, Push and Pull, uh, a furniture comedy for Hans Hoffman. And then there are those guerrilla actions again in the garden, uh, Kuzawa, the grand orgy to awaken the death of guerrilla art action protest for the Vietnam War that also happened uh, at MoMA. And then from 1971, there was a whole series of performances happening at MoMA, but in the garden. Here we see uh, the Steve Paxton uh, performing. So, as I said, this is a history that is there, that is mainly in the archives, and somehow it's still, even there is a department now from 2007, it's still somehow non-visible. And, um, uh, traditionally, so in relation actually to the history of performance art, John Jonas said, the American artist John Jonas said, I have spent the last 40 years existing when performance was not considered as art. It was just not considered. It has been ignored by art history. Or Peggy Pellan noticed that movement-based thinking is not fitting the narrative structure of art history, mainly because of some of its aspects like ephemerality, improvisation, or somatic grace. And also if we think traditionally performance art was, not cons was considered uncollectible. Many performance artworks had a political basis which disavowed the market and conceived the work as dependent on the presence of the artist to perform it. But recently, in the last 10 or even more years or so, we are, we are actually witnessing the, mo the, the moment when performance art is part of the collection, when many institutions, uh, private and public, are collecting performance. So very often when this collecting is happening or showing a performance is happening, it happens through objects, so-called props, so to, to what remains after the performance. So it's again, we're talking about a fixed object. But when we're talking about really a live event in the, uh, in the museum, uh, it's something that uh, somehow it's, um, I think it's related to two things. In a way, it's for sure related through the very historical movement we are moment we are living now. So we're living in a moment of the uh, service economy, the moment of experience economy, the moment when uh, the dematerialization is a form of a hype. There is, uh, to the, the symbolic uh, capital is attached to the live event. We are all the time on of the stage. We are all the time somehow performing. So there is a kind of a surveillance uh, society in a way. And so in also, professions, the, the, the profession of, of cur the curator is becoming a profession, so the, we also have a profession for curating a performance. So museums be begin began also more service provider, event oriented. So there is the really somehow the, the whole situation of the, this neoliberal economy we are living now, it is somehow open to performance. But also when we talk and we, I think this was a good example during the session, I think that also artistic practices somehow change in a way, or, or it's more, when if, are, if we look at the contemporary artistic practices, as I said during the, the panel, when we talk about performance art, we usually talk about the, the body art of the 70s, but actually everything was more or less happening in the body of the artist, no? It was somehow of the locus of experience. So even revolution were happening to the body artist. The body is fragile, it's gendered, it's the heart of civil rights and so on. But today, if we think artists, some of the artists are also using performance as they use video, as they use installation. And Katrin Wood, who is the, the curator of performance at the Tate, she said the reemergence of interest in performance as medium recently is due to the lifting, uh, to the, to the lifting of the forgotten fact of art's social basis prior to its material one. 
new work and newly discovered histories and geographies put the social base into the foreground, while the object often recedes into the middle or in the back. So there's been talking a lot about a delegated performance, about our sourcing performance, about the use of the choreography in performance, just to remind the Andrew Hewitt uh, book of social choreography. So how actually uh, artists are dealing also with the everyday. So there's a lot about storytelling, a lot of actions uh, become, everyday actions become choreographed and somehow they're revealing also their social or democratic or not democratic impetus. So a lot of uh, also, with actions are kind of um, also protests and um, and actually I wanted to um, to give some example uh, from my experience before MoMA in the, in the Museum of Warsaw when uh, we started the, the museum really from the scratch in 2007 so we started thinking how to, what will be our programming what is our collection what is our statement what what we want to do as an institution and um, one of the first project it was with Sharon Hayes, with American artist Sharon Hayes, whose uh, project is called In the Near Future, and she's in a way re-staging um, protests from the past. And here we did a whole research for her about the solidarity movement in the 80s, and she was in the protesting in the middle of the street. This means BYS Benje, she was, she is, and she will be, which is a famous slogan from that time. And then, as we were naive at the time, because when she left, we, we, we didn't know that actually we were supposed to send it to the gallery, we live stream, I don't know if she said that. So we use it, for example, this was a protest, uh, this was a gay parade in, in Warsaw in the very same year. Or, uh, for example, uh, this was an email that we received from Tanya Bruguera at the time when we organized a per, uh, conference 6889. And uh, so Tanya sent this description, I will not read because we don't have enough time. So we did exactly what she asked for us. Of course, we couldn't, um, yes, so we did what, what she asked and this is, was the result with those people walking in front of the uh, Palace of Science and Culture in Warsaw and the photo was taken uh, after that. And uh, this is the work, and oh, this work is now, the Tanya Bruguera work is uh, part of the, uh, of the collection. And this was our first foreign work of the collection. It was in 2008, Katerina Sheda, the Slovak artist Katerina Sheda. The work is called This Is Not A Game. And this is also the title of my uh, presentation today, where she ex actually in a, in a very small village in, uh, in Slovakia, sh where people are always complaining, nothing is happening here, there's nothing here, there's nothing there. She organized their life uh, in the sense that they all had to do certain activities and certain time. It was a kind of a, 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 of a game. And um, uh, Thomas Pospisul, writing about uh, Katerina Sheda, Referring to this work, uh, he said, uh, we can't help asking whether Shedda's film paradoxically combines means traditionally identified with totalitarianism, like uniformity and synchronization of activities, and the happy end in which the artist seemingly undoes the totalitarian spell that burdens such practices. Does the artist collaborating with the specific communities and imposing a certain discipline, behavioral codes, defines a particular acting structure and reveals social immanent tensions and limits? And this I'm saying in order to, to somehow, in a way, argue what, how, what is pr performance today and also the fact that those three works that I just showed, the two work are part of the collection, and if I look at them to today perspective, in, in, in when we are talking a lot about performance, also for the perspective of the, of the museum when I work today, there could be also works that be could part of the performance collection, while at the time it was really working with the, with the contemporary artist, and we were not even maybe thinking of being aware that it's actually about so much about uh, performance. And then, this is not a game, it's also appeared in this statement from Yvonne Rayner, and uh, uh, Rosalie already mentioned her. It was uh, the information show in 71, sorry, correct, at MoMA, where she was invited, it was a famous, uh, sh uh, famous uh, show of conceptual art in 71, and she was invited to participate, but she uh, refused, and this is what she, uh, what she, this is, 
she sent. Actually, this was published in the in the catalog. Again, this is found in, in the MoMA uh, in the MoMA archives, and it's again some part of the somehow uh, non-official story. Because one of the of the question, I think, it's because we're, when we are dealing with all the statistic practices, also the contemporary, when we are dealing also from the past, and when we have one institute, and we want to present in an institution, of course. In the moment when contemporary art entered big institutions like MoMA, so it's more showing videos, more process-oriented works, also more, more performance, and somehow the, the museum has to open up, I think, it, 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 because if we can almost sometimes with, with m my uh, colleagues, you're joking like all contemporary art, in a way it's media and, and performance, in a way you, you have to open up, but then the structure, of course, the framework, it, it's different. And then it's like, how do you deal with those em emancipatory somehow artistic practices in, uh, in, a, so in, in, in the context of an uh, institution? And one of the examples uh, it we face, there are many examples, but I will not go through, through everything, I'll just cho choose a few of them, was in, when we organized the Martha Rosler garage sale last year, uh, together with Sabine Breitwieser. And this is a work from Martha Lo Rosler from 1973, which she organized the first garage sale in the San Francisco, in the University Gallery in San Francisco. And the garage sale, mm, people are usually just uh, mm, opening their garages and selling things they don't consider um, useful or uh, important uh, uh, anymore. And she so translated it in the, in the art context, but what was really interesting for MoMA, so we know that the institution are somehow inscribing the cultural and, uh, and the economic value to objects, it was to bring this informal economy in the space uh, on, of the museum, and so considering also that those objects were considered zero utility or zero value from the people who uh, gave to them. So it was really, an, um, I think, also an important moment to have the atrium of the, of the museum, somehow the heart of the museum filled with the junk, basically, and to have this idea of selling junk, to selling objects in the museum by an artist who became famous from 1973 until uh, today, and to have this, this burden and this uh, somehow economic exchange going in the middle of, of the museum. And it also having all this junk in the museum, it was a very um, challenging also for the institution itself. We had to go to so many uh, processes of disinfication and, uh, and, so, and so on. There were a lot of uh, administration limits to do something like that. And I have to say that we use also uh, Song Dong as an example of, of, of when the atrium was refilled with, uh, with, with things. It was uh, uh, two, three years before. And uh, one, of the, one of the phenomena, so following uh, the, the idea of the live art and the live presence in the museum, it's also the, it's the, the, the increasing interest in dance. And uh, in, in New York, and Rosalie knows, there are a lot of now panels going on about dance in the museum, the presentation of dance in the museum and wild dance in the museum. And I would like that to read you the, the, um, the definition, actually, the, the argument of Andre Lepecki that he gave in his book, Dance. It's a Whitechapel uh, edition about its... Um, the, he, he resembled different essays about dance. It's one of the first books, actually, about dance. And he said, uh, just a second, I lost my page. Um, da, da, da. Uh, so yeah, because also dance beca became a, a really somehow very conceptually became very important also for curating philosophy and also for contemporary art. I, I, I mentioned the social choreography before. So mm, dance, uh, so uh, he thinks that one of the reasons why dance is so contemporary today is because of, his, of its constitutive elements, which are ephemerality, corporeality, precariousness, scoring, and performativity. 
Uh, these qualities or traits are responsible for dense capacity to harness and activate crucial and compositional elements crucial to the fusion of polities and aesthetics that characterized so much of the contemporary art scene and sensibility. So ephemerality, no objects behind, possibility to create alternative economies of objecthood in art, stepping out of the process of commodification and fetishization on tangible objects. And this is a kind of a frontier that you, the marketing institution always need because it seems that the performance, it's not more there, it's already part of the, of the collections. Corporeality, possibility of embodying, uh, precariousness. It underlines the current precarization of life in the sphere of the triumphant neoliberal globalization on financial capital. Scoring. Political reverberations across contemporary art practices since choreography displays disciplined bodies operating in a regime of obedience for the sake of bringing an art piece into the world. And um, as I said before, there was also a um, example of, of, of dance in the history of, of MoMA and last year there was a, um, in the atrium another in, uh, quite successful project with Ralph Flemon who brought six of the most known uh, contemporary choreographers and um, months ago, I just finished something like months ago, I invited Boris Charmat, a French choreographer in his uh, Musée de la Danse to, to come to MoMA, and um, so Boris Sharmetz, he's the head of uh, Musée de la Danse, which used to be, which is the center, national center of choreography in Rennes, in France, northwest of France, that he renamed the dancing museum, Musée de la Danse, and because he somehow found it that dance were always between the school and the theater, and he needed a third way to deal with dance, so it's thinking uh, um, an institution through dance and dance through, in through institution, and during three weeks, uh, three weeks, three weekends, from Friday to Sunday, there were three uh, projects. That somehow, what I wanted to say also, because I remember when I started working also in, in Warsaw, in the, in, in the museum in Warsaw, there was always this idea how to, you know, what, what you, your museum to do, and working in MoMA, which is very old, it's very difficult to talk so generally, but as being the, the youngest department of the museum, you can't, put yourself certain goals and aims. And then always what comes to mind, at least to me, is this Capra, Alan Capra definition of the museum. So the educational element, the cultural history, and how to steer the actions, how to involve the audience. Of course, the audience is a big part. I didn't have time to talk maybe during the, the discussion. And I think this project finished um, not even a month ago, so I think there are a lot of things to, to digest and to articulate still, but there was something that happened in the museum that we are all very proud of. Uh, this is the first uh, um, this is the first project which was called 20 Dancers from 20th Century, and uh, we invited 20 different dancers from Europe, from the States. Here on, uh, on the left, it's uh, Leo Mi, she's um, a voguer from the Harlem uh, Vogue Hall. Um, some Merce Cunningham dancer, Shelley Center, who used to dance with Trisha Brown. And uh, each of them performed solos of their choice, may, from like historical solos, personal uh, solos, and so on. She was, allow me, of course, was voguing. And there was this moment they would, they would perform at the same time in the museum, but also talking to the public, in a sense, presenting themselves, themselves and explaining what they were doing. And this was for the, during the opening hours of the museum. So somehow there was a collection of the dance history, of the performance history. It was not only uh, the performance, it was also, this is uh, Jim Fletcher, the actor Jim Fletcher, who is performing Vito Conchi, and uh, two of the performers performing uh, also Lynn Hirschman, Roberta Baltimore. So we tried somehow to, to have this idea, how do you show history? How do you show the history of performance? How do you show the history of dance that is not only through the objects or through documentations, but through actually a live body, considering that maybe the, the body of the artist, in particular of the dancers, is the site somehow of the, of, of the memory. Uh, the second project was in the atrium. Uh, it was with 24 dancers and 20 who were executing 25 movements. The, the, the piece was called uh, Suspension of Conflicts. And there it was really incredible how it was just the atrium, just this row space with the dancers. 
uh, again for five hours. So this idea that also the, the, it's not just an event because there was always this question, how can you avoid the idea of the festival of the, of the event? And there was this tension between actually the fact that they were, because they were, each movement uh, depend on, on the previous one. So those dancers somehow were very much depending one on each other and there was this really tension between it's very difficult to show it in a, uh, actually in, in, a, in a photo, but the tension between the stillness and the movement, the sculpture and the life, the individual and the, and the collective, and also the, the impact with the public was very special, very different than, than usually. The third project that was again in the atrium that seemed more uh, conventional, it's called Flipbook, and the idea it was to use this book, which is 50 years of Merce Cunningham, so very, um, known uh, uh, chore uh, choreographer, and to literally flip it, so to perform image by image, and uh, involving also the public. So it happened also that in the, among the public there was also Yvonne Rainer, who is in, in, in the middle of the, of, the, of, the, of the image, and then the, the Valda Setterfield has this first hour where she was talking about her experience. She used to, to work a lot with Merce Cunningham. And uh, so this was also, very interesting because it, it, it gives, it was a lot how do you do restage, how you reenact, how you reperform, can you do it, can you repeat history or not. And also all this idea of the, of the score, which is somehow, as, as Lepeck is saying, it is part, there is certain fluidity, flexibility in relation to the, to the, to the score, so somehow everybody can repeat it. While there was a, we had a conversation when Simone Forti, when she was talking how dance somehow can be, uh, the, how dance used to be teach also orally. So there was always this moment of collectiveness, of sharedness, but now the score is almost, uh, almost enough. So I have to, to finish. I also, and I, I know we have a discussion there because in, in uh, relation to the um, ethics, I, I um, I was thinking to say something about the idea of the uh, um, com committed art. There was an um, there is an essay of Igor Zabel, and there was a conference in Ljubljana a week ago on, entitled like that. And I thought it was interesting in relation to the to the all the questions that we are posing about ethics. But this I can I, ca I will I will talk more about that. So during the during the the discussion and just my conclusion in. Uh, my conclusion to the, to the talk, it's a question. So do art practices foreground performance and the performative have lessons for how the art museum today should explore the role of sociality in art and thus how it should think about programming, pedagogy and collection strategy?